The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 11, we're looking at verses 5 and 6. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Grace Alone. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to the Our Father and Our God and in the Holy Spirit. We recognize that we ourselves are nothing and that only by thy Holy Spirit can thy word go forth into the hearts of men. We pray thee therefore this day that it may have free course and that thou mayest be glorified. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying together in the epistle to the Romans in the 11th chapter and come today to the 5th and 6th verses. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, in the midst of the body of the true believers, God tells us, there are those whose racial and national backgrounds show them to belong to God's ancient people. There were, in the beginning of the church at the time of Pentecost, many thousands of Christians, all of whom who had been transferred into the church from their former covenant relationship to God in Abraham. The twelve disciples were Jews. The seven deacons were also children of Israel. The thousands who were the objects of God's continuing grace at Pentecost were all of Israel. Originally, the church was 100% Jewish. Then God sent Peter to the house of Cornelius, and the first Gentiles were brought in. Then Paul, who had been separated from his mother's womb, as he tells the Galatians and Timothy, was transferred from his covenant relationship into membership in the body of Christ and was commissioned to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Very rapidly, the thousands of the Gentiles who were saved changed the numerical balance so that they became the majority and former Israelites an ever-decreasing minority. By the time that Paul came to write the epistle to the Romans, he could see that the Gentiles were in the vast majority, and he could also see that the number of his own people who believed that Jesus was Jehovah the Messiah was but a minority of the race as well as a minority within the church. The fact was, however, that they were in the church. They were called a remnant, and they were called a remnant in comparison with the great number of the children of Israel who did not believe. This verse follows the comparison which he drew from the experience of Elijah, which we saw in our last study. The great prophet thought that he was alone until God revealed to him that there was a remnant, 7,000, who had not bowed to Baal. Almost the whole nation had gone into idolatry, but God had preserved for himself in Elijah's day a remnant. Now, the times were parallel, the times of Elijah and the times of Paul. In Paul's day, the nation was almost entirely given over to a greater idolatry, but God had preserved for himself a remnant. Now, we say that the idolatry in Paul's day was a greater one, and we justify our statement in the following way. In the days of Elijah, the people were in great ignorance, and it was their leaders who had deluded them. They had carnal gods put before them, and with their bodies they turned to the lusts that accompanied such worship. They were not too concerned with spiritual things. But by the time of Christ, the Pharisees and others had brought the Old Testament religion to an outwardly moral form. There were no idols in the synagogues or in the temples. There was no worship of the gods of sex depravity as in the days of Elijah. The religion of the Old Testament had become moral, ascetic, self-righteous, and hypocritical. The coming of the Lord Jesus had revealed this religion for what it really was. The hatred of the leaders against the Lord was all the more intense because they had attained so much concerning which the flesh could be proud. Where the apostasy in the time of Elijah had been mainly a deception of the flesh, the apostasy in the time of Christ 
had become a deception of the Spirit. And yet, nevertheless, God had preserved for himself a remnant. There was no reason within the people themselves for God to have preserved any portion of them. All had come under the righteous judgment of God. But grace had manifested itself because God is the faithful God. And in order to make his argument stronger, Paul adds that the remnant that was saved was not only saved through the grace of God, but that it was elective grace. Once more, we are carried back into the heart of God and given to look upon the fact that he had an eternal purpose. Our present text cannot be understood without reading into it all that has been said in the ninth chapter of this epistle. All who are being saved, whether from the world of Israel or from among the Gentiles, were being saved by the sovereign choice of God, purely on the grounds of his grace. And then Paul proceeds to amplify once more the nature of grace. And our text continues, If by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. The Revised Standard Version stops at this point and leaves out the last half of the verse because the majority of the manuscripts do stop at this point. A strong minority of the manuscripts, however, restates the argument in another form, even as we have it in the King James Version. The argument indeed is complete if we stop at the end of the first half of the verse, but it's well to consider the restatement also. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, Otherwise, work is no more work. John Owen, who translated Calvin's commentaries into English more than a hundred years ago, says in his footnote on this passage, this kind of statement is wholly in unison with the apostle's mode of writing. He often states a thing positively and negatively, or in two different ways. And he gives us a comparison in Romans 4, 5 and 9, 1 and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he continues that then an omission is more probable than an addition. Every reason except the number of manuscripts is in favor of the genuineness of the last half of the verse. What God is saying here is that grace and works are mutually exclusive. They are of an opposite character. And Calvin rightly states that he who establishes the one overturns the other. Let us spell the matter out again, since God is pleased to bring the question before us at this point in the narrative. Salvation by grace means simply that salvation is of God, that it is by God, and that it is through him and what he has done. You see, the whole span of our relationship with God rests solidly on the fact of his love and his grace. No part of it rests on me or upon anything that I have done or could do. This truth must be spoken again and again because of the perverse desire of the old human heart to take some credit for salvation or for our maintenance in the Christian life. We must come to the place, as the writer of the Hebrews points out, where we must cease from our works as God ceased from his. It may be well to note some of the false doctrines that have been brought forth by those who wish to exalt the flesh. One of these false doctrines, a very old doctrine, is that God's choice of his own people is based on nothing more than advanced knowledge of how an individual will act of his own free will independently from God. Calvin says, but if no place for works can be admitted in election without obscuring the gratuitous goodness of God, which he designed thereby to be so much commended to us, what answer can be given to Paul by those infatuated persons who make the cause of election to be that worthiness in us which God has foreseen? For whether you introduce works future or past, this declaration of Paul opposes you, for he says that grace leaves nothing to works. Paul speaks not here of our reconciliation with God, nor of the means, nor of the proximate causes of our salvation, but he ascends higher, even to this. Why God, before the foundation of the world, chose only some and passed by others, and he declares 
that God was led to make this difference by nothing else but by his own good pleasure. For if any place is given to works, so much he maintains is taken away from grace. Now it hence follows that it is absurd to blend foreknowledge of works with God's choice. For if God chooses some and rejects others, as he has foreseen them to be worthy or unworthy of salvation, then the grace of God, the reward of works being established, cannot reign alone, but must be only in part the cause of our election. For as Paul has reasoned before concerning the justification of Abraham, that where reward is paid, there grace is not freely bestowed. And so now he draws his argument from the same fountain, that if works come to the account, when God adopts a certain number of men unto salvation, reward is a matter of debt, and that therefore it is not a free gift. Our text in Romans is in fact the simplest expression of elementary mathematics. If a debt has been entirely paid, there is nothing left to be paid. If you have a debt of $100, for example, and your brother offers to pay the debt for you and present you with the receipt for the full amount, then you are no more obligated to the creditor. The debt has been fully satisfied. No part of it can henceforth be levied against you. So if the Lord Jesus Christ paid for the full guilt of our sin, then there is no guilt to be paid for in any other fashion. There is no verse in the Bible that says that repentance pays for sin. There is no verse in the Bible that says that subsequent works pay for sin. There is no verse in the Bible that says that baptism or any other religious act pays for sin. But there are many verses which show us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. It might be well in passing to speak of a verse in Peter's Pentecostal address which has been twisted against the rest of Bible truth. This misapplied verse is Peter's announcement, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A sect interprets the verse to mean that the literal water of baptism takes away original sin and that no one can be saved apart from this right. Now such an interpretation would negate every great statement in the scriptures concerning the finality of the redemption provided by Christ and the completeness of the work that was done by our Lord when he poured out his life for us. The true meaning of this passage in Acts is the following. First, it is addressed to those who were there even those who are described as being members of all of the house of Israel. And having completed his statement concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, Peter said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? It was in these circumstances that Peter answered with the text which we have quoted. It was not addressed to Gentiles. There wasn't a Gentile in the whole crowd, except perhaps a few who are called proselytes. That is, Gentiles who had been circumcised and adopted into the tribes of Israel and who were considered as Jews even by the most fanatical of the legalists. All who were there, therefore, were in a covenant relationship with God. They were in the same relationship to God that all men of the Old Testament covenant had been. If John the Baptist had not been beheaded, he possibly would have been standing among them. These 3,000 Jews were composed of people like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were those who had seen and followed Jesus and who had witnessed his power. They had many of them, no doubt, eaten of the bread when he fed the 5,000 and they watched Lazarus after he had been raised from the dead. But their faith had been as weak as that of Cleopas and the other disciple who, even though told of the resurrection, had not stayed in Jerusalem to see if the Lord was alive on resurrection day. And now these people are told that they're to make an about face. 
for this is the true meaning of the word that is translated repent, and that they are to be identified into the remission of sins on the grounds of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I have put down that last sentence, I have chosen the prepositions most carefully to set forth the relationship of the believer with Christ. I have stated that they were to be identified into the remission of sins. For the Greek preposition is the same as that used in Corinthians, where we have, for in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. The identification is into the remission of sins, just as it is into the body of Christ. The idea is that which we have set forth at considerable length in our study of the sixth chapter of Romans. We are placed by the Holy Spirit as being in Christ in every phase of his work. And as we are identified into his death, we are identified into the fruit of his death, namely the forgiveness of our sins. All this is on the grounds of the work which he accomplished at Calvary, and this is bound up with his name. And we return now to the main theme of our text in Romans. Since salvation is by grace, works has no part in it. If any human act or deed, if any religious rite or ceremony, if anything that comes from man in any way had any part in salvation, then it could no longer be said that salvation is by grace. If salvation is by grace, then it is not of work. For as soon as there is a mixture of even the smallest percentage of works, grace is debased and transformed into something that is horrible to consider. The character of grace is so changed that it is no more grace. The reason that this is true is the source of the works. They have originated within the heart of man. They have their spring in the heart of that which has come from Adam. The whole idea of works is that man can provide a basis which will force God to give him some blessing as a just reward for the works. The whole idea of grace is that God acts toward man entirely according to that which is to be found within his own divine nature of love. The two ideas are mutually exclusive and destroy each other when placed together. Perhaps the greatest example that Paul could give is that which he used when refuting Peter. In Antioch, as we are told in Galatians 2, Paul resisted Peter to the face because Peter was to be blamed. Peter had gone back to legalism and the hypocrisy of pretending to the Jews that he was still living like a Jew long after he had begun to associate with Gentiles, to eat with them, and to act as Gentiles acted. Israel had a religion that was bounded on all sides by the prescriptions of the law. Paul says to Peter that in spite of this fact, that they who were Jews by nature had been forced to come to Christ alone for salvation and not depend in the slightest on the formal religion in which they had been brought up. Paul simply says, even we who were Jews by nature and not Sinners of the Gentiles, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Light cannot exist with darkness. Darkness cannot exist with light. Grace cannot exist with works. Works cannot exist with grace. God has the right to bestow gifts upon his children, and this he does to magnify his own grace. This does not mean that unregenerate man has any right to demand that God should hand out gifts to him as though he had earned the right to them, as though God were in debt to him and had to pay that debt. God is at liberty to give whatever he pleases, and he is at liberty to give whenever he pleases and he is at liberty to give to whomsoever he pleases. Anything that he has promised to give, he will give without question, because he is the unchangeable God whose very name is truth. Now, this does not give any man the right to claim what God has never promised, 
and what God has proclaimed in many places throughout his word that he will never give. And God states many times that he will never give salvation to anyone that wishes to mix it with works. From time to time, I meet with men who say to me that they want God to be just to them and that they can rely on his justice to give them what they deserve. I cry out at once that they're fools. I want nothing of the justice of God. Oh, thank God I shall never have anything to do with the justice of God. If I had the justice of God, I would be in hell. I want nothing of the justice of God. It was the justice of God that struck down the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. It now is possible for me to have nothing to do with the justice of God because I have run to the cross and laid hold upon the mercy and the grace of God. And once any man has known what it is to touch the grace of God, he wants no part of justice, but he wants only to hand his life over to the Lord that a continuous stream of good works should come from the life of Christ within us and that men may see these good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven because grace, which excluded works for salvation, has produced grace, which flows forth in good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Let no one criticize the preaching of pure grace and say that it's a doctrine that means that man can believe and then do as he pleases. Oh, no, no. When man has been the object of pure grace, he has the renewed heart. And when he has the renewed heart, from that heart must flow the works that are produced by the character of Christ within us. Love so amazing, so divine, demands soul, life, and all. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take the great simplicity of this truth to our hearts. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.